All right, if you have your Bibles with you, I would ask you to turn to Acts 13. Acts 13, and we're going to begin reading in verse 43. Acts 13, and beginning in verse 43, and if you know where you're at in your timeline, uh, we're at the very early part of Paul's ministry. He's been saved, he's been sent out, and he's ready to go uh, to do the bidding of the gospel. Uh, and he is preaching in a place that's dominated by the Jews. So in verse 43, we'll pick that up. The Bible says, Now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first been spoken to you. But seeing you put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. For lo, had the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee in the light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be salvation unto the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your precious word. God, we help tonight that you would open your word to the hearts of your hearers, Lord. We pray that you would open the hearts of the brokenhearted here, Lord, that you would uh, uh, cause them to understand and know that salvation and redemption comes only from you. Lord, we pray that you would burden them with their sins so badly that they would cry out to you and that they would understand that redemption and salvation is in your name. Lord God, we pray that you would bless your word according to your grace. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Yeah. Now, some fairly familiar verses of Scripture, sometimes uh, I think we rush, the, we rush through them because it is a pivotal moment in the, in the gospel ministry of Paul when his, uh, his ministry turns to the Gentiles. Now, from this day forward, many of the Jews would not hear the gospel again except through Peter. Now, uh, the church at Jerusalem was still operating because much time after this, Paul went to Peter and they had discussions and even had arguments concerning the gospel. So that's not to say the Jews never heard the gospel again, but the evangelical ministry of Paul turned at this point and went to the Gentiles. And we all remember that from this section of Scripture, but one thing I think we miss in this is the simplicity of the gospel. Now, I love and I, I endear the truth concerning uh, uh, election and predestination and the goodness of God, but I love the simplicity of salvation. Just coming in childlike faith, yeah, belief. Yeah. And uh, we need to hear more of that today. You know what? If we give our babies, everybody's talking about amount of baby formula. You know what? If we start our babies out on, uh, on steak, they're going to choke to death. They need to hear the gospel. Uh, things like predestination in the Lord's true church, that's for, for more mature Christians. What we need to get out is the gospel. And, and I really believe that's why many times... Uh, You'll see the, uh, the, the, the New Testament church preaching the gospel outside and worshiping on the inside because they knew those people would choke on the meteor part of the word. And, and so we find that as they're preaching this, they make it very simplistic for them. Verse 43, I want you to see, now when the Jews, uh, excuse me, verse 43, now... When the congregation was broken up, 
Now, they were speaking of a great multitude that had met on the Sabbath or on Saturday down at the temple, and Paul preached unto them Jesus. You know, wherever we go, whatever we do, the most simplistic sharing of the gospel starts with Jesus. Uh, the most simplistic thing is to say is he was the very sinless son of God and he died on your behalf. If you can get that out, that's all you need. That's all you uh, have to understand. You don't have to be a theologian. You don't have to understand the weightier matters of the scripture. Just share the gospel. Uh, Jesus died for you. And so we find that's exactly what they do. They preach it to the Jews and they teach it to the proselyte Jews. Now, often we, we get a bad term of this proselyte, and Paul later on uh, indicates that there are some proselyte Christians. But a proselyte is this, it's someone that's not born that way. It is, and what Paul meant to the churches when he called them proselytes, that they would never been born again to start with. And what he's saying here, these individuals weren't Jews anyway. Mm -hmm. they, they were non-Jews. But if you know your Old Testament law, there was methods, there were ways to become Jew. You, know, you, uh, you didn't have to be born in the bloodline. They're, they're, they took other people in. And so those type of people were coming. The Jews and the wannabe Jews we're coming to hear the gospel. You know what? I would to God that everybody under the sound of my voice this evening came here to hear the gospel. The good news right. of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. That, that, that's what will make a lifelong difference. That will make, that's what will cling you unto Christ is just hearing the gospel. And that's what they did. He, and I also want you to see after the meeting was broken up. In other words, they went to them individually. Let me tell you about Jesus. Let, let me tell you what he did for me. I was on the road to Damascus to break up that church and God stepped in. Let, let me tell you that. So after the meeting was over with, they went to him individually. You know, uh, that's about the most effective form of ministry that you can have is just teach talking to people individually uh, because you have a better relationship with them that way anyway and so that's exactly what they did at the end of verse 43 i want you to see they bid them to continue in the grace of god uh, in other words grow i think it's at the end of the uh, letter to the church at ephesus he said grow in grace uh, you know, grace is a never-ending thing. The older I get, the more that I am to stand amazed that he even looked at me, much less saved my never-dying soul, placed me in one of his churches. It just, you know why that makes it more amazing these days? Because I've grown in grace. See, you don't even realize how sinful you are, really. And when he saves you, you realize, you know, I can't, I can't believe he saved me from that grow in grace. And so that's what Paul and Silas's message were about. And he just said, continue growing, continue studying, continue moving. Verse 44, and the next Sabbath, and the next Sabbath day, came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. Now, I want you to see the first meeting was the Jews and the proselyte Jews, and now everybody was coming. You know what? You're not going to have much trouble from other groups until your group starts to grow. And most especially if some of theirs comes to you. Mm -hmm. the, the, then, then the feathers get ruffled, don't they? Mm -hmm. and, and, and so I want you to see it was no different in, in the times of Paul that when this began to happen, the Jews got upset. You know what the best indication of redemption is? When you hear someone that's saved, that you rejoice in it. You don't get upset. You don't get right, mad. Right. Uh, Matthew lived in deception a lot of years. I'm not. You know what? I'm glad Sean Prescott preached the gospel to him. Yeah. It, it don't upset me none. I, I just give glory to God yeah, for right. it. Now, the the indicator of a lost person is mad because it happened. So we. Uh, 
We need just to simply rejoice in that. We don't need to have the attitude that the Jews had in that day. And, and we find they were upset and, and mad about the situation as it was occurring. Uh, verse 45, when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy or jealousy and spake against those things which were spoken of Paul. Now, I want you to get this. Not until the numbers began to change was what Paul was teaching spoken against. All that Paul was preaching here was the Lord Jesus Christ. And, you know, when they came together that first time, uh, uh, they, they was wanting to kill Jesus back in Jesus' ministry. And, he said, and they said they consider him a great prophet. So they didn't want to do anything against the Lord Jesus. Now they were so upset. Then they, when the following got great in numbers, then they said, listen, what they're telling you ain't even true. Uh, it's Jewish law and Jewish law alone. That's when they got upset. And, and so I want you to see that the simplicity of grace is still very very offensive to many today. Uh, people, it's our nature. It's our fleshly, carnal nature. We want something that we can do. Uh, yeah. That's why the Catholic Church has been what it is for so many, 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 many years. Uh, you, you can do, the, the, there's more to do there than you can shake a stick at. But it's just, it's just simple belief. Belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. Belief in his sufficiency. That's all you need. And so that made the Jews upset. Verse 46, Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first be spoken to you, but seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Now, I want you to see that uh, Paul and Silas was fulfilling their first part of the commission. They presented the simplistic gospel to the, to the Jewish people. And they said, we're done. We're finished. We're going to the Gentiles. You know, uh, uh, what, a, what a sad little portion of scripture right here when he says, we're done with you. Yeah. Uh, very, very, you know, I hope I never get to the point that there's not a time that I can share the gospel. Uh, because I don't ever want to walk away and say, I'm done with you. Uh, we, need, we, we need to be loving people. And so we find that the new ministry plan was to go to the Gentiles. Now, I want you to compare the two because it is two totally different groups of people. Here we have the Jews that knew all the foretelling prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ from the days of Elijah, uh, from the days of even of the Genesis all the way up to the time of Christ. They understood that the Messiah was coming. They understood that the Lord Jesus Christ was marked out specifically for who he was. And now they're going to a dumb, ignorant people that has no history with God at all and they're going to share the gospel with them. Now here in the South, that's almost impossible for us to grasp because it's never been a time we haven't heard of the gospel. There, there's never been a time, and I use this word loosely, there's never been a time we didn't know there was a church somewhere and it's hard for us to get, but can you imagine the ministry and turning to a people that didn't even know how are you going to approach that? Jared, if you get to the backside of the desert one day as a missionary and they don't even know who Jehovah is, where are you going to begin? I think you have to be simplistic, don't you? Brother Isaac Heil, when he was in Turkey, he said, all I could really do was tell them my own experience because they had no idea what the Word of God was. <laughs> And so I believe with that said, that is why it was so simplistic in the verses to follow because that's all they had to work with. Verse 47, uh, And for so have the Lord commanded us, saying, I set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, 
that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. Now there you have it literally in one verse. The foreknowledge of God, they were ordained that way in the simple childlike faith and belief in the very same verse. See, they couldn't, they couldn't, he, they couldn't go depth with that bunch of Gentile people, but they could, they could tell them something simply, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Just childlike faith. Um, that's what we need, is it not? You know what sends missionaries to far lands? Simply believing when it says, go ye into all the world. Just childlike faith. You know what? I'm going to do this, and I don't know where the money's coming from, and I don't know what, what's going to be, how my needs are going to be met, but it says it, and I'm going childlike faith. That's what spreads the gospel. And, and so we find that uh, Paul and Silas follow through with this, and we see a great number of churches uh, simply out of that faith, just coming out of their work. Now go with me to Acts chapter 8, just a little further back, and we'll see something very simple, and again, I want you to see it's the obedience of one man that causes this to happen. Uh, Philip uh, be, lending himself to the work of the Lord and being obedient. Philip, we don't know a lot about him. I think in one place the Bible says that uh, he was a deacon. Uh, uh, we never see that he's a preacher. We never see things like that. But I will say this, what he was was an obedient servant. Someone lending himself to the Lord, making himself available. So in Acts uh, 8, Acts 8 in verse 35. Acts 8 in verse 35, the Bible says, Then Philip opened his mouth. Now, if you remember, the eunuch had been down to Jerusalem and came home empty. Remember, he had his very own set of scripture, which was a, a rich, rich gift in that day. And he was, he was looking through it and had no idea what it says. You know what, have you ever watched year after year, day after day, and, and wonder why people can't see the Word of God for what it is? Well, they're in the same condition as the eunuch. Now, I want you to see the eunuch, unlike the Gentiles, the other, the other Gentiles he was speaking to was a very educated, smart, smart man and still did not understand who the Lord Jesus Christ was. Uh, did not understand, I believe where he's reading from was Isaiah 53. Now, uh, I want you uh, to follow along with me now in uh, verse 35. And then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Very simple. Very easy to understand. He had read. He had read of the prediction of the crucifixion in Isaiah 53. He pointed out in every every event that happened on the day of the crucifixion on the cross of Calvary that Jesus met the sinless perfection necessary and had been poured out of, him, of his own self on the cross of Calvary, a full and uh, complete atonement, and he preached unto him Christ. And as they went on their way, and no doubt the conversation was going back and forth, and maybe, maybe that eunuch said, what about this? And he said, Christ is sufficient. Well, what about good works? Christ is sufficient. And it, it says as they went on their way, so there had to be more conversation. Right. Maybe in glory, <laughs> we'll know about what they said. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Yeah. And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, mm -hmm. thou mayest. Very simple. Mm -hmm. Notice what he believes, because the Campbellite people measure you up mm -hmm. on this. And he answered and said,
I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You know, uh, isn't that simplistic? Isn't, isn't that so easy? Just simple faith and belief that the Lord Jesus Christ was exactly whom he said he was. And then it says, and they stopped, they stopped and went down, and he baptized him. But what he believed was simply that he was the son. Baptism is not even mentioned in what he believed. It, it, was, it was simply that he believed that Jesus Christ was exactly who he said he was. So simplistic, isn't it? And yet still we make it so complicated, don't we? Uh, you wonder why our churches are, are, are shrinking on the vine? A lot of it is that we lack compassion. And the other thing, we don't preach the simplistic gospel nearly like we should. Acts chapter 9, verse 40, just a little further over. Acts chapter 9 and verse 40. The Bible said, But Peter put them all forth and kneeled down. Now what had happened, if you remember this, there was a woman, a young girl, that had been sick. Someone, her father had came and said, Come help with her. Uh, we think she's going to die. Notice what he says. But Peter put them all forth and kneeled down and prayed, turning to the body and said, Tabitha, Tabitha, Tabitha arise. And she opened her eyes and she saw and she saw Peter and set up. And he gave her his hand and lifted up and lifted her up, and when he called, the saints and the widows presented her alive, and it was known through all, out all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Now, I want you to notice a couple of things. First of all, the miraculous event. Um, if you have noticed time and time again in scriptures, at least three times, and then the Bible says toward the end, I think, of the Gospel of Matthew, that maybe it was the end of John. It says if it was all put in there, it couldn't be contained. Right. He raised the dead. But we know three instances for sure where Jesus raised the dead. Uh, we know that he raised the, the young girl to life, and we know that he stopped the funeral procession, interrupted the trip to the graveyard, and we know that Lazarus was done stinking. And he, he raised them all back to life. You ever wonder why that gets our attention more than most? Well, it's a manifestation of what happens when you're saved. That inward man comes alive, that it's graveyard dead. And he brings him the newness of life. Now, here we find many years later, uh, Peter doing the exact same thing. Now, if you know the story of this woman, uh, she was a good woman. And she's dead now. And God raised her back. Seeing great miracles, seeing wonderful things done. But notice the simplicity uh, toward the end of 42. And many believed in the Lord. You know, I've said for years, and I've seen a little—I've seen a little of it, and got enough of it that I know that I want more uh, of a real revival, true revival. And the reason I want that is just like this right here. I believe when when the miraculous event of revival happens, you're going to see people saved. And I want you to see after this wonderful miracle, it simply says, and they believe. You know, you see something like that, it's going to get your attention. And they just believed. You know, you know what revival is about? Believing that book for exactly what it says. Plus nothing, minus nothing, just believing it for what it says. And that's exactly where we should be. Now, your belief or your believing is a measure of your faith. Do you believe these events happened just as they said they were? I do. <coughs> I believe there was a woman named Tabitha, and she tasted death twice. 
I believe there was a man called Lazarus and he was stinking and rotten and in the tomb. And God called him forth. The Lord Jesus called him forth because he has dominion over that. And just as I'm surely believe that those things have occurred, I believe salvation is in the heart of those who believe. We, we, need, we need to see more of that. Now go with me to the Gospel of Matthew, and we're going to close. Uh, very familiar verses of Scripture. I've read it in your hearing probably a hundred times over the last 20 plus years. But I think it's good that uh, we read it again. <coughs> Matthew 16, verse 16. Matthew 16 and verse 16. The Bible says, uh, I'm sorry, let's go back up to 14. He'd been asked, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Who do men say that Jesus... Now, th this is the reality. Mankind, studied mankind, cannot, that, cannot refute the existence of Christ. That historically, he lived and died. They, they can't refute that. So notice the attitude of men in the days of uh, huh, in the in the days of Christ. And they say, and he said, uh, he said, Peter, who do they say I am? The answer, verse 14, and they said, Some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Who do you say? that Jesus is. Well, that's defined by your culture, is it not? I dare to say nobody in this building can remember the first time that they heard the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I know that I can't. I can't remember that ever occurring to me. But I want you to say, just because you know about him, doesn't say whom he is to you. You can, you can know him and, and, and not know what he did, what he fulfilled, what he made, what he did in his life. You can know about him and not know it. And so Peter gives them that information. Then notice what he says, a life-changing question. And he saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? And that's the question tonight that we all need to answer for ourselves before we go home. Who do you say that Christ is? Do you believe he, and not simply the Son of God, but oh, what a miracle that is. But do you know him to be Savior? Do you know him to be the worker of grace? All I, all I need to know is about, about Jesus is that he saved my soul. Yeah. That's what I need to know. And that's what will carry me out here to the cemetery one day is just simply knowing that Jesus saved. Have a, having a relationship just like I have with my wife. A closeness, uh, a closeness like there is no other. That, that, that's, that is salvation. So he, he says, what about it, Peter? Who do you think I am? Peter answered and said, Thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. Blessed are thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood have not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Now, Peter got a revealed truth. He got a belief. It, it went from here down, down to here. And he understood and knew of a certainty who Christ is. Uh, we, never, we never need to give up on the simplicity of the gospel. Telling people of the goodness of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and the means to salvation is just simple belief. Uh, don't make it any comp more complicated than it has to be. Mm -hmm.